Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Wednesday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Do you know where you were one year ago today? I do. I was in Manhattan seeing Jennifer Pace at the Larry Beachman Theater with my dear friend Sumitsuki as my date. And that was the last time I was in New York City since this pandemic hit. I actually live 25 minutes north of Manhattan. And I miss this city so much. And I bring this up because our guest today also has a love affair with New York City. I read this book, My 30 Years in New York City by John Strangey. And here's the cabaret convention. Uh, uh, I use that as a bookmark uh, from last year at this time. Um, I read this book uh, about a year or so ago uh, when the book first came out. And uh, and my dear friend Rosa Puzzi said, you should have John Strangey on the show. They are mutual friends. And it's like two worlds were coming together because I said, absolutely, I would love to have John on this show. Because as I was reading this book, it was very much like I was reading my own story. Uh, I come from a small town. Uh, I came to New York uh, this year, will be, I think, 42 years ago, 1979, I came to New York. And uh, I know what the excitement was of that little boy, Ricky Skipper, growing up in South Carolina and dreaming of coming to New York. And the interesting thing about that time is that I can remember every detail. I can remember uh, what I was wearing the day that I came to New York, all the details. And it was very much the same thing with John reading this book. John Strangey is here. And before we begin, John, I want to ask you, we are in the midst of this pandemic. Uh, today marks 364 days since our theater shut down. How are you doing, really, in the midst of all this? Well, I'm, I'm holding up as best I can. I take a day at a time. Every day seems to be a challenge, but thank God now that they have, I've gotten both shots, so things are looking up. So I see light at the end of the, t of the tunnel now. But I mean, it was, it's been so depressing. I mean, I, I went to an interview on 44th Street, West 44th the other day, and you know, I passed Sardis. That's, it's totally dead. I mean, there's nothing. It's, it's beyond, it's just so depressing. You know, I have, I have two friends that are here from Boston that are that have been here uh, on business this week, and they, I mean, their favorite restaurant was not open. Uh, oh. the center of the city and the hustle and bustle of New York City, I can't even imagine because it's been a year since I was in Manhattan. I uh, and uh, I remember my first day in New York, and you in every minute detail. Uh, I lived that journey with you all again. And we're going to get there in a few moments. Um, it's such a great book, first of all, oh, John. Thank you. Thank uh, you. But I, you know, first of all, celebrate you uh, putting your life uh, on paper. And it's not all, uh, you know, roses and valentines. You no, not at all. Not at all. It's, it, it, the book is my valentine to New York because I love it so much. I, there's no place like New York. It, it, uh, I, I just, it's, it's magic. It's magic. Even in the state that the world is in now, it's still a magical New York. You, you, that's, that's always going to be, you know, and it, it'll, it'll come back. Everything will come back. Now you left New York for a while, but you just recently came back. Um, and of course, I mean, did you always maintain your residence here in New York? Did you always? I have didn't. I wish to hell I had. I bought my last apartment in 1995. Beautiful apartment on 59th Street, mm -hmm. 20th floor. I paid $150,000 in 1995. When I sold it in 2003, I got like 500. It's a million three now. I mean, I could kill myself. That's why I drink. But. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. And I had a house in East Hampton. Mm -hmm. I had that for 10 years and I sold that. I mean, ah, you know, should have, would have, could have. 
So what was the deciding factor for you? And then we're going to go backwards. But what was the deciding factor for you to leave New York several years ago uh, because you have such a love affair with the city? Well, my partner, John, we've been together 35 years. He died in, uh, in uh, May of 2019, but he wanted to move to Florida. He wanted to move to Florida. And so I did it for him. But in all fairness, I made I had made some bad financial decisions too. I it was it was necessary necessary for me to either sell Manhattan or East Hampton, but I I sold both. I wish to hell I had kept one of them, mm. but I didn't. And you know, such is life. What, uh, was it easier coming back this time, or was it uh, a hard? I mean, was it hard for you to reestablish yourself in New York, having lived here before? Not really, no, because I felt at home once I got here. You know, New York is my home; it always will be. I say I I I was born in Dallas, mm -hmm. but I grew up in New York. That's the difference. Well, you know, it's funny that, you know, you say that because I always celebrate two birthdays. There's uh -huh. my actual birthday when Ricky Skipper was born okay. in Conway, oh. South Carolina. And then there's August 5th of 1979 when Richard Skipper was born. Hey, uh, exactly, exactly. That day that I arrived in New York City and I, like you, I dreamed of it and I dreamed oh. of it. I want to go back. You are, uh, and you also uh, are one of four children, I think. Yes, I'm the youngest. Oh, oh. I'm always with the baby, and uh, yeah, my two sisters are the oldest. They're they're now they're eighty and eighty eight, eighty two and eighty, I think. And my brother just my brother died five months before John died, so oh. that was not a good year. And he was eight years older than I, but we were very close growing up. We couldn't have been closer. He was a sweetheart, Albert, mm -hmm. and uh, but. So, and I'm the opposite of that. I'm the oldest of four, ah. and I know what it was like for me. Well, I want to go back. Let's go to the five year old John Strangey. Okay. Uh, and the your family life, uh, your exposure, uh, at the beginning, uh, to uh, the arts, theater, music. Uh, and we'll talk about some of those episodes that you uh, really talk about in the book. Uh, but going back to that time frame. Uh, before school starts and getting into that world. Um, was there a lot of music in your household? Oh, sure. I always, oh, I, I, I was always uh, singing. I always had the records on. I, uh, you know, I, I fell in love with Julie Andrews, Mary Poppins at a very young age. That was the first thing I told her. When I did meet her the first time, I, I said, I've been in love with you ever since Mary Poppins. And uh, and then luckily when I had my house in East Hampton, she and Blake Edwards didn't live far from me. And so I'd see them at benefits and whatnot. And her daughter, Emma Walton, she, her, she and her husband, uh, Stephen Hamilton, they created the Bay Street Theater. Yes. And uh, and I was a big supporter of that. That's where I met Julie Andrews, by the way, at the Bay Street Theater. Yeah, well, that's, that's I met her be, once before that, but I did see her at, at uh, at one of the benefits that they had, the last, well, actually, it was the one in 2000, and Julie was there. And one of the auction items was to have Julie do a message for your answering machine. And I was determined I was going to win this thing. And it was between me and this other guy. It got all the way up to $12,500. I gave up. And then they ran up to my table. They said, Julie will do one for you for $10,000. So I, I got her to do it for $10,000. She did two for me. In one, she says, hello, Julie Andrews here. My darling friends, John and John, can't come to the phone right now. But if you leave your name and number at the sound of the beep, I'm sure they'll love to get back to you. And as always, remember, just a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Go. <laughs> <laughs> and it was worth $10,000. worth 10000 And then she did another one also just for me. That's, that's on my phone now, actually. Well, it's very funny because, uh, you know, Tommy, uh, we're going to drop names today. Uh, Tommy yeah. is a friend of mine. He had a birthday last week, and I called him. And his um, outgoing message is still Carol Channing. <laughs> uh, I love it. Birthday. There you go. <laughs> and I regret so much that I never asked her to do one for me. So, <laughs> so, so this five-year-old John in Dallas, you know, and uh, uh, Mary Poppins. And, uh, and then when... What was the deciding factor for you? These are 
covered in the book, of course, uh, that you wanted to go into the theater? Well, first I wanted, I had to move to New York. My father brought me to the uh, uh, New York World's Fair in 1964. And that's when I decided I have to move here. And then, okay, I entered high school. I was a very, I was very shy. I was very introverted. I really was. Uh, and, but I, I, I had my drama class Carolyn, Mrs. Carolyn Doyle was my drama teacher. She was lovely, a beautiful, beautiful woman. And she brought me out. I just, I came out, I, I was a total different person after that. You know? And I, I, uh, I tried out for, for drama, the drama club, and I, which I got into. I did a, I've always admired Noel Coward's work. And I did a scene from Private Lives. And that got me into the Playhouse. And, uh, and then I, I, uh, uh, the first play I did, well, I did, I did The King and I. It was Sir Edward Ramsey and The King and I. And then it, well, I went on to do Wait Until Dark. And then my my then I did My Fair Lady. I have the best British accent. I I I, I my accent is better than Julie's. I, mean, I have I, I <laughs> no swear to you. twang in there at all. I swear to you. I swear you are here. Here I, I'm gonna I'll do it for you. Okay, here's a bit. <clears throat> I find the moment that a woman makes friends with me, she becomes jealous, exacting, suspicious, and a damn nuisance. And I find the moment that I make friends with a woman, I become selfish and radical. So here I am, a confirmed old bachelor, and like that you remain so. Uh, well, after all, Pickering, I'm an ordinary man. Uh, that's a bit. I'll, I'll, I'll stop with that. But, but I, you know, how old when you did the king, uh, when you did uh, My Fair Lady? Why that was high school. I was uh, 17. Now, I started doing local theater in my hometown. Also, I, I had this wonderful mentor, uh, uh -huh. Lawrence Epps. Uh -huh. And she said, uh, Ricky, you're going to be a great actor. But not <laughs> if you don't get rid of that. Uh, I had an accent you could cut with a knife. Really? Uh, oh, I, I never had an accent. I was very conscious of, of the Texas accent. Oh. No, I, you know, I had an accent. I worked, and it was difficult for me. Yeah. You know, everyone in my family, they still have it. And I would go to these elocution lessons with Miss mm -hmm. Epps. And then I would come home and and everybody around me was talking. And uh, th they used to say, Ricky's putting on airs again. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, I always, I sounded like, I always sounded British in high school because I was so conscious of my speech. Literally, I, I, sounded, I sounded like Julie. And uh, so I, I, I never had. Uh, the accent to worry about, but but I, I was terrible. I I remember in school, I I I asked to be uh, taken out of one class because I couldn't understand the teacher. Her accent was so thick. I swear to you, I could not understand the teacher. It was ridiculous. <laughs> so you have this wonderful success. You open, and then the next day tragedy hits, sort of. What, what, I'm sorry. What 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 are we speaking of here? Uh, my fair lady. Oh. My fairly the tragedy hits. Your but accident the next day, after the opening night. The, my accident? Yes, when, when you, you cut your arm. Oh, that thing. Oh, okay. Oh, you know, you remember it better than I. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Here, I, I, I was. It was terrible. I, I had gone outside. This is after the whole thing. I had gone outside to get the paper, and I locked myself out. And I remembered that we had, uh, uh, there was a window that was half broken in, in, in the front. And so I figured, well, I'll just take down the pane and, you know, and get in. And the second I touch the pane, it comes down, slashes my arm. So I get into the, go through the window. I'm, blood is spurting out everywhere. My mother comes back. She sees me. And, and I'm, I'm losing all this blood. And I pass out. It was just, yeah, oh, I, I, Thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> <laughs> the point that I want to make is that nothing was going to stop you from going. No, on. nothing was going to stop me. I, I mean, of course, you know, the next day at school, that my my arms in a, a, a mess, and everybody seems to say your performance wasn't that bad. You didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I overcame. Yes, I overcame that. And so, so you, you start doing a lot of local theater. Um, I, my senior year, I tried out for Theater 3. It's a professional theater in Dallas. And uh, I, I got a part in the plays, The Thing. And that went relatively well. And then the next 
then they put on a musical, the Venetian twins, which I had to have three sword fights every night. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it was in the, it was sort of the star of the show, Larry O'Dwyer. He was a very successful man, very professional, very good, but we didn't get along. So some nights we were really going at the, the sword fights. We, <laughs> the we didn't, we didn't uh, do what we were supposed to. We were really fighting, but. Uh, <laughs> so I mean, obviously, I mean, you mentioned, you know, uh, and you mentioned this earlier as well. Your father brought you to the uh, 1964 World's Fair. Right. Um, and then you start doing theater shortly after that uh, because arts and education is something that's very important to me. Oh, uh, sure. For those who... Uh, are watching who have children who want to go into this business. Can you talk a little bit for you, from your own perspective as to why community theater uh, and high school productions and everything is very important in terms of building a sense of community? Well, I, I think it gives one confidence and it, it's, uh, it brings people together. It's, everybody loves the theater. I mean, you, you, you go to the theater, you're in a different world. It's, it's an escape. And I think we all need escape. And uh, uh, it, it was an escape for me, actually. I, I uh, my parents got divorced when I was thirteen. I'm sorry. And uh, you know, it was difficult, for, you know, th th with things, and you know, things happened at home and whatnot. And that was my escape, going into a different part. So it, it worked well for me at that time. Now, um, anyone who knows me knows of my love of Hello Dolly. Oh, I please. You, your first Broadway show that you saw was Hello Dolly, starring Betty Grable. There it is. And there's a, you have the playable handy. I have it. There we go. Yes, it was wonderful. Your, I mean, about the experience of seeing her that night. Oh, oh, she was fantastic. This was my, my brother and I drove to to New York, and we were here just one or two days actually. And uh, it was it was a wonderful show. It was it was so great, yeah. It really really was. And uh, seeing her, I th I think she was the first one after Carol. Uh, no, well she uh, she came in uh, after she was actually the fourth one. Oh really? I thought I was thinking she was the first uh, one. Ginger yeah. Rogers, and then oh, okay. my knowledge of this: Ginger Rogers, and then Martha Ray, and then Betty. Okay. Yeah, no, I enjoyed her. Her performance was great. I, I saw Hello, Dolly with a number of people. The one that I enjoyed most, I even saw it with Carol Channing at a later one. I love Pearl Bailey. In, it, it was a wonder. I actually I saw that in Dallas. <laughs> but I love, I think that was my favorite with Pearl Bailey. She was just super, you know. Now, obviously, the experience of going to the theater and hopefully that's going to come back for all of us very, very soon. Uh, but the excitement of going to the theater, can you talk about the excitement of going to the theater that first time for you? Oh, I, it was, it was, it was just phenomenal. I, I felt the magic right away. I, the second, the overture, it, it, it upsets me that the, but so many shows now are getting rid of the overture mm -hmm. but that, I mean, that gets me going to hear that, that music. I, I love that. I'll tell you something very interesting, um, a tidbit, just to go off course for just a second. When Hello, Dolly! first opened, it did not have an overture. Uh, Gower Champion yeah. jumped right into the story with no oh. overture, and David Merrick fought and eventually got the overture. I, I, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, I want to go back. You're, you're in high school. You're doing theater and everything. What was the deciding moment for you? Uh, that you made the decision that you were going to go to New York. And if you can take us back to the response from your family at that time. Uh, well, my father was against it completely. Um, uh, but I, I was, what, what happened was I, when I was, I was, I decided I would either go to Juilliard or the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. And <clears throat> as fate would have it, when I was working at Theater 3, Juilliard was auditioning people at Theater 3. So I figured, well, my, this is it. I, <laughs> you know, it's fate. <clears throat> Excuse me. And John Houseman was head of the drama department at Juilliard, and he was auditioning people. And so I auditioned for him at Theater 3. I did not prepare myself well. I did a scene from Look Back in Anger. And I didn't even read the play. I mean, how stupid could I have been? But I auditioned. I didn't do a good job. 
I understand they only accept like 25 people out of 5,000. <laughs> and I wasn't one of them. So then I went on, I tried out for the American Academy and I was accepted that. Well, you know, that story, you go into real uh, detail about <laughs> the fact that you, if you want to take a sip of water or something, by all means do so. Uh, but you you mention uh, in the book that uh, it was a turning point for you because Absolutely. you were not prepared uh, and you would never allow that moment to happen again like that. Right. Going into an audition. Right. So, um, so when you came to New York, um, uh did you come with savings? Uh, did your parents uh, invest in your coming to New York? Uh, how did that happen for you? Well, when I went to the American Academy, I mean, my father gave me an allowance and whatnot. So that's how I survived, you know, that first year. And uh, uh, I wasn't that impressed with the Academy. And I it was stupid of me. I should have made the best of it. But I, I didn't apply myself well. And I wasn't accepted the second year, and I was a mess. <coughs> and uh, so I, my father forced me, he, he said, come back to Dallas, try college. I want you to go to the four-year college. And so I said, well, OK. I gave up. And so I, I tried a junior college. And I said, well, Dad, if I'm in New York, if I'm in Dallas, I'm going to need a car. And so he bought me a car, and he put in my name. I sold the car. I moved back to New York. So and I was in New York the next 30 years. We didn't speak for a little time after that. But, well, <laughs> but, that, but that's how I got it. Got but I that. love how your book opens because it took me <clears> back <throat> to the day that I flew to New York, getting on the plane, coming to New York. Um, and, you know, the, the family that there to wave you off and everything. Um, so once you got on the plane, and you're headed to New York. Take us back to the, all the emotions that you were feeling at that moment. Oh, I was just, I was beyond excited. I really was. I was just beyond, beyond. And uh, I, 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 I stayed, a girl that I met at the drama and when I was going to the academy, Deborah Ray, I stayed with she and a friend at their apartment for a month so I could get things going. Debbie and I uh, dated for a while before I went to the other side of the track. <laughs> There's always one. I, I, yeah, I, I love Debbie. I, I, she was so sweet. I, and we've, I've gotten in contact with since. Uh, we saw each other about 10 years ago here in New York when I was visiting. And uh, anyway, but she was a sweetheart. But anyway, what was I saying? Uh, so I said, getting on the plane and the, those emotions that you were feeling that first day. Oh, oh, please! I, I drank. I was drinking. I had ordered a Manhattan, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and uh, I, I just loved it. And it, in those days, I, uh, and I never, I, I, I would go out every night. Go, do, do you remember Ted Hooks backstage? Oh, are you kidding me? That was oh, fine. <laughs> I'd love that place. We probably saw each other there. <laughs> and I used to I used to sit around that beautiful piano and listen to Steve Ross. He or, and I are good friends. Uh, yes, yeah, same here. Or Ronnie yeah. Wright sitting and playing right. here. When I I when I came back, <coughs> I had a. <coughs> I'm sorry. No, it happens. I um, I had a memorial for my partner John at at. Uh, don't tell mamas. Oh yeah, okay. And on September the 9th of 2019, and Steve Ross came and he sang. He was so sweet. And uh, do you want to get a sip of water? We can take a pause. Do you want? I I think I will. Is that okay? Or a sip of vodka? A sip. Whatever gets you through. <laughs> you know? I, uh, get a Manhattan, and it's great. Okay. Um, you know, while we're waiting for John to come back, you know, I'll talk, you know, about those. Uh, when I first came to New York, and I've talked about this in previous interviews, and uh, I had this vision of New York, and I came in 1979, very different New York. Uh, but I had this vision that I was coming to the world of Breakfast at Tiffany's and Sunday in New York, and uh, that girl. Uh, but what I ended up finding when I got here was the world of Midnight Cowboy 
and uh, cruising and uh, uh, Needle Park, uh, you know, and all, it was a different New York uh, than the world that I had imagined. Uh, but with all of that, um, I will stress to everybody that my love for this city and the excitement of being New York City uh, was far more uh, exciting to me than any of the quote unquote negatives that were in place. And when John comes back, we'll I wanna talk a little bit about those aspects of what New York uh, was like for him when he first came here. So are you okay, John? I'm fine, I'm good. That's great. Um, I was just saying, I don't know if you overheard what I was saying while you stepped away for a second, right. but I had this vision of New York. I didn't have what you had, and that was the experience of having come to New York before I truly made the jump to come here. Um, so when you got to New York, and I know that you talk about getting into your hotel and going for a walk and walking over to where the uh, American Academy of Dramatic Arts was and just getting a sense of the city. Mm. Um, but you had already had that experience of being here. Um, did that feeling come back to you? Was it a different feeling for you having made the decision to move here? Uh, tell us a little bit about the New York that you actually moved into. Well, it, 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 it was just, a, 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 I just felt the, a magical. It, I was in a, I was, I was like a little boy at a candy store. And I, I just, everything, everything, every corner, everything just created a feeling in me that I'd never had before in any other place. No, no other city can do it to you what New York does. It's, it's, it's magical, everything. So what was your first day at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts like in New York? Here you are, uh, a young man in New York, uh, getting ready to embark on uh, a career in the theater. Uh, you know, what was that first day like for you in the class? Oh, I, I was overjoyed. I was just, I was loving it so much. I, I, I said I was disappointed with the school. It didn't seem as professional as I'd hoped. But I wish I had gone to the new school or something. Well, let but me ask you this: you know, it, you know, in all honesty, um, were your expectations too high, or do you really feel that uh, they were not up to? Obviously, you had under your belt uh, years of doing theater uh, in Texas before you got here. Uh, do you feel that they were not up to the standards that you were yeah, speaking to? I do. I don't think my expectations were too high at all. Okay. I just think it was, it just wasn't, it may have, it, uh, it, a good chance it's not that way now, but in 1973, I just wasn't happy with it. I wish I had gone to the new school or something. That's where Elaine Stritch, Marlon Brando, they all went there. I think I might have had better luck there, but I just, I just wasn't that impressed with it. Now, can you I, I also, I went on later on, I would take lessons at the HB studio mm -hmm. in the village. That's where I you went know. when I first came. <laughs> yeah, that was a good school. William Hickey was my teacher there. And, he, you know, he went on to... Oh, yeah. He made an he, uh, Academy Award nomination. But he was a charming man, very nice. And how long did it take for <laughs> you uh, before you felt that you actually... Uh, were now a New Yorker. For me, it was like night and day. Oh, I, I felt like a New Yorker the second I moved here. I really did. Yeah. I, oh, yeah. Now, like I said, I, I, I was, I mean, of course, I mean, it was difficult to do theater, as you know, when you're doing a nine to five job. I mean, it was, and I had a variety of jobs when I first moved here. <laughs> but I finally, got one on Wall Street mm -hmm. for a stock brokerage, and that did well. And it was during that job that I got my first soap opera. <laughs> and um, you can only call in sick for so long. And they eventually, I told them the truth, and we worked out something. I was able to work a bit. I did One Life to Live and Guiding Light, <coughs> excuse me, and As the World Turns. But uh, I was able to keep that job and do things at the same time, but not as much as I wanted to. 
Now, um, I want to ask you, how much knowledge did you have uh, coming to New York about the pursuit of a career in this business? Uh, I mean, with, for me personally, I read every book I could read. I knew to pick up backstage on Thursday mornings, <laughs> uh, the uh, news stands and everything. How much knowledge did you have when you first came to New York? Oh, I, 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 I explored everything about the city and whatnot. I, I think I was pretty knowledgeable with it. Yeah, yeah. No, I felt, I felt right away. I felt, uh, I felt at home. I felt good. Yeah. No, I felt very good about that. And take us back to your first audition in New York. My first audition. My well, actually, one of my first auditions I got actually. Um, this was the. First, I gave it the office. Mm. Whoops. I love the page. There I, there I am at the bottom. And uh, I got this. It was a fun show. It ran for a couple of months right on 56th Street. And uh, it, I, oh, the funny story, one night in the show, each night I had to drop my pants at one point. I played a Texan on one of the scenes. <laughs> And I had to drop it. the accent. Yeah, I, I, uh, I had to drop my pants. And one night, I forgot to put. I didn't put my shorts on. This was this was the days of O Calcutta, so I got away with it. But one night, I, I, it was I was totally naked. My little fellow was showing. Not little. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I beg to differ, <laughs> but and the ticket uh, sales went up, so to speak. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, it was sold out, uh, sold out every night after that. <laughs> but it was a fun little show, and I became good friends. Well, Tom Gutas and I, we were we were dated for a while. He, very nice guy. Oh, funny story happened with him. We went to a. a to see the opening of it was a, a, pre, a special preview of Funny Lady with Barbara Streisand and and it was a double feature. The first show was Stepford Wives and then was Funny Lady. Now that's a great double bill. Oh yeah. <laughs> and and I and and I was enjoying the Stepford Wives. It was a fun show. And it was at the end and it was the most you know exciting part of it and people were coming in, you know, for the pre to to sit but for the beginning of funny lady and whatnot. And these two guys sit in front of me. And this is the most exciting part in the Stepford Wives. And I'm like totally into it. And they're they're talking and whatnot and I'm I'm like losing it. And so I I I with I uh, with my foot I you know push the their chair you know for them to shut up. And it turned out the guy that I did that it was Rex Reed and it, <laughs> <laughs> Rex Reed and a friend, and so I'm, I, you know, my my and Tom was like, oh, "That's Rex Reed." I said, "I don't care." There, <laughs> so. But, now I have to ask: uh, Did Stepford Wives get a good review from Rex Reed? Well, no, he was there for the, he wasn't there for Stepford Wives. He was there for Funny Lady. Oh, for Funny Lady. Stepford Wives had been on for a while. Yeah, no, he was just there for Funny Lady. I didn't care for Funny Lady. I didn't think it was up to funny girl. I love funny girl, but I didn't like funny lady. Uh, I want to go back again uh, to uh, 1974 when you first got here. Um, can you talk about the landscape of what New York was like, the energy uh, that you felt as a young man in New York and learning about yourself and getting acclimated in New York? Oh, well, I, I felt the energy. I mean, the energy of New York was just phenomenal at that time, I, I felt. And uh, it was, I, I compared New York in the 70s to, but, but this is going into another subject, really, but to Berlin, like in Cabaret. It was anything goes in the 70s in New York. I mean, everything was, mm -hmm. you know, everything was possible. Everything was they were you know it was it was it was wonderful. I, and were you it. part of the club scene in New York at that time as well? Did you go to studio? A little club? bit. I mean, I did not having much money, but I did what I could. Like I said, I was going to backstage all the time, and I was Sardis. Um, I I love Sardis. I I I was the regular there until the uh, until we had the, uh, until everything closed. Me too. Me too. And I was I. 
In fact, I, I gave Sean Sardis, he was the great, great grandson of Vincent. <clears throat> I gave him a copy of my book and he put it in their showcase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I, and this is later on, but on 999, I threw a big party at Sardis for all for a hundred of my friends. It was wonderful. And uh, it, it was a fun evening. It really was. And you have a Hirschfeld that was that was uh, part of that evening. How did the Hirschfeld come about? In 1996, I went to the uh, the Margot Feiden Gallery on Madison Avenue. That's where they showed all of his work and whatnot. And, yeah, yeah, they're in the village now. I think. Yes, they moved. Yeah, but uh, so I was. I, I loved going to see. I always admired him so much. And so I was talking to the guy, the manager, and I said, well, well, does he just do anybody, you know, for an unemployed actor, would he do me? And they said, yeah, for $12,000 he would. And so I said, hey, what the hell? And uh, so I gave them a few snapshots of me. And then about a couple of weeks later, I went to his townhouse on 95th Street. <clears throat> and uh, his studio was on the fourth floor. You know, and, he, and so I, I go up, and I, he was charming. He was so nice. And uh, uh, so I sat in front of him, Yeah, and, you, and he was seated in his famous barber's chair. You heard he had a barber's yeah. chair? Yeah. And so I sat in front of him for maybe 25 minutes, and he did two quick sketches, and uh, which I didn't see. And then I had the final product two weeks later. There I be. And are there any Ninas in your... There are two Ninas, yeah. There's one in my sideburn and one up here. There are two Ninas. So, so that's my my only claim to fame. And so, where, no, no, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> uh, so where uh, where do you keep your Hirschfeld? It's right. You can't see it. It's on the other opposite of the wall. It's right there. You're, you're staring at it. Yeah, I stare at it every day. <laughs> you know, uh, Carol Channing had a, a photograph in her office of the two of us together, which is hanging in. Oh, oh. And uh, she said to me, I see you every morning, whether I want to or not. And I want to get back to the book because that's, you know, we w want people to buy the book because it is an amazing read. You're a very good writer, John. Oh, thank you. So did you keep journals all along or? People ask me that. The way the what if, I didn't keep a diary. The way that I remembered what happened each year, whatever show was on Broadway, literally, I could remember what where I was, what happened, and, and everything. Uh, oh, well, let me show you this. Um, my Fair Lady, a few years ago, they advertised my book in the Playbill. I love right? it. I love it. Let go. Circle. Is that not cool? That is amazing. <laughs> so what surprised you the most about yourself as you sat down to write this book? And what was your process? Did you write in a linear fashion or did you put memories down as you began to remember them? I would just take a year at a time and I'd, I'd uh, whatever I could remember, whatever stood out for me in that year, I'd, I'd make a note. I even made a couple of notes here, and I want to go over a few of these sure. uh, uh, words that you use. Uh, there are 30 adjectives. We're not going to go through all of them, but I went through uh, a, a few of them in the first few years. And I want to say, I want you to tell us the first thing that pops into your mind and, you know, and give us a little uh, more depth to this. And of course, don't give away too much. We want people to read the book, but you start with 1973 Magical, and that's pretty much self-explanatory. We know why it was magical. Oh, 1979 yeah. for me is magical. But what made it so magical for you? Well, 1973, well, going to the Academy and whatnot, I, and, and experiencing all the Broadway shows and everything, I, um, well, when I came here to, to audition, uh, my mother I, let me stay here a whole week by myself. And uh, it was, I mean, that, that was the year of Follies and No, No, Nanette and uh, Oh, Calcutta. And I, I, I saw Butterflies Are Free with Gloria Swanson. I mean, that was, that was a thrill. Mm -hmm. And, 
you know, it was just, oh, it was just every every night. And I discovered Joe Allen's, you know, I was going there and my, my Sardis. And, oh, I, I just, uh, oh, just well, be I consider myself very, very fortunate because <laughs> a lot of my childhood idols, um, I've gotten to know very well. Some of them have become friends. Um, if you could elaborate on that for yourself, uh, some of the people you mentioned, Julie Andrews, and of course having her do your uh, answering machine, but some of the other celebrities along the way that you really had to pinch yourself. Well, the one that I really, uh, I, I don't know how I condense this, I can condense this story, but um, at one point, I, I the YMCA on 47th Street on the east side, I, I was between apartments. I thought, I'll just stay at the Y for a few weeks and find an apartment. Well, I ended up staying <clears throat> at the Y for a year and a half. And uh, I had, I had, uh, I knew that Catherine Hepburn lived on 49th Street. She lived next door to Stephen Sondheim. And uh, if I could jump, my, my good Deborah, the one that I dated, and, and she she was an actress, and she looked, she always reminded me of Catherine Hepburn. And she had heard that Kate was going to uh, direct a show with Irene Selznick Mar of, of a book called Martha. And Debbie thought she'd be perfect for the part. Um, and and she had heard that uh, she was hoping. Well, actually, we had Catherine Hepburn's phone number because Debbie's roommate took singing lessons from Catherine Hepburn's singing teacher, and Debbie wanted to call her and you know see if she could get uh, an audition for this thing, but nothing ever happened of it. And so one day, a book the a book about Catherine Hepburn comes out, the, and I, I run to the phone. I call Debbie. Debbie, the book came out. She said, oh, buy me a copy. So I'm walking home. Was this I, me? Is this Catherine Hepburn's memoir? I'm oh, sorry? Was it Catherine Hepburn's memoir that came out, or was it somebody else who had written it? Was, no, it was, the first mem it was the first book. No, it was the first book that was ever really written about her. It was, it was 1975, I think. Okay. Yeah. And so I buy the two copies, and I'm walking home. And I, I and I go down forty I 49th Street and I think, oh, maybe I'll just stand here, maybe, you know, Kate will come out or something. And um after about 15 minutes, the guy comes up to me, he introduces himself, and it was Louis Vargas, and he's Stephen Sondheim's gentleman's gentleman. He was on the fourth floor. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, what, what he, I said, oh, I, I, you know, I, I heard the Kate live on this street. I just, he said, well, there she is. And she and, and her, her, her secretary were, were moving things out of the car. I, I didn't even know. And he said, I'll, I'll introduce you. So he introduced me. And uh, it, I was a mess. I was a nervous wreck. But, you know, she, she was sweet. She was very charming and nice and everything. And, uh, and then Lewis and I became very good friends. And for for years, and I was spent. I was having coffee in Stephen Sondheim's kitchen all the time. And uh, but one another funny thing that happened with Lewis, Kate was on tour with A Matter of Gravity, terrible play. Did you see it? I didn't see it, but it was. It, it, I think it had uh, opened. Uh, what year was nineteen? It was like nineteen seventy five. Yes. Yeah, it was before I got to New York. Yeah, it was a terrible, terrible show. But anyway, she was on tour with it. And uh, Lewis said, uh, I need to go over and speak to Nora, her cook. Do you want to come with me? I said, sure. So we go over to the townhouse, and Nora says, would you like a tour of the house? And I'm like, yeah, please. <laughs> uh, are you kidding? And and there would uh, go through. The first thing I noticed in the kitchen, you know, she bought this house in like 1927. In the kitchen, it, I think it was the original refrigerator and oven. And everything was, you know. And all of it back in time, yeah. And have all of her furniture. So I go through the whole townhouse. The furniture is very. It's Catherine Hepburn. She's you know, old and beat up, and give the what you'd expect her to have. But then on her fourth floor, on her fourth floor were her Academy Awards, her Oscars. I held her Academy Award from Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. <laughs> I held it in this hand. One of my favorite movies. And, and the first one that she won for Morning Glory. The, 
the Oscars were different then. I held yeah. that. One. Yes. So that was like, what a thrill, you know. <laughs> well, I know, and I'm going to bring this up because you have a special Tony Award uh, that is really nearby. You should this was given to Dolores Gray. I, I got into collecting all sorts of memorabilia. This was Dolores Gray. Tony, this is how they presented them back then. In 1953, she won for Carnival in Flanders, a musical. Uh, best actress. She and uh, very short. Sure, yeah. It only ran for five nights, and she won best actress. So here is my Tony Award. So the, the, never let it be said I don't have a Tony Award. <laughs> Now, you mentioned 1974 Exquisite. What made 1974 Exquisite for you? 1974? Mm hmm. That's in your notes in the book. 1974. 1974. <laughs> what, did, what did I say was exquisite? Well, you use these, uh, these adjectives to describe each of the years in your life. Oh, right, right. And you say 1974 was uh, exquisite for you. Oh, and okay. Why that particular adjective to describe the year? Oh, it, it was just uh, 1974. Da, da, da. Well, that was my first, my first Broadway, my my first uh, play, mm -hmm. my first musical. That's that's what made it exquisite. Um, and in nineteen seventy five, one year that stood out. Uh, did you happen to see Ballroom? No, no, I didn't. Well, it only ran for three months, but it was a, a wonderful show. I saw it 13 times. Uh, it was a brilliant show. I loved it. I just thought it was, and I went to the Tony Awards that year, and that was exciting. That was the yeah, only year I went to the Tony Awards. The Tony Awards were very different then. Uh, they were more intimate. I uh, liked it better then. Now it, that so do I. I liked it much, much better. Um well, Michael Riedel talks about this in his book. Uh, it moved to the Radio City Music Hall, uh, essentially, when they asked Rosie O'Donnell uh, to host the Tony Awards. Uh, yeah, that's it. This is the program from 1975. At the Schubert Theater. Very right. intimate evening. Right, right. So how did that come about that you got the invitation to go to the Tony Awards? Because oh, I, it was invitation only at that time. No, I... I I was able. It wasn't invitation only. It wasn't. No, no, not at all. No, I was. I had no trouble getting tickets. Yeah, I just got one. I was in the balcony, but uh, it was fine. But it was a. It was a, a wonderful evening. Dorothy Loudon signed my signed it, and uh, and after 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 the Tony Awards, I went to backstage. So it was a, it was a fun evening. But so here's the choreography, at least. So you mentioned earlier um, your partner and your uh, you know wanting to move to Florida and everything, and uh, I I can only imagine having this love affair that you have with New York, uh, that you love, you know overrules everything that you decide to leave New York, you go to uh, Florida, um, you know if you can take us back to what you were experiencing, um, it must have been. Uh, you know, a really painful experience for you. It was. I hated. I was. I was a mess having to leave New York, and uh, and I made the most of it. I mean, I was. We were in Palm Beach every night going out, <laughs> and uh, I mean, I'd go out. In the, we kept. We'd go out every night. I'm not a cook. I I never. Mm -hmm. You know, with a restaurant on every corner in New York, you don't need to cook. You don't need to. You know. And we did the same thing in Palm Beach. I mean, we were still going to Palm Beach every night. And it was lovely. It was nice. But it wasn't New York. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I hated not being here. I really did. But, uh, but did, I mean, but you loved, did you love work, uh, live, having a place at East Hampton? I mean, I, I, I loved East Hampton. I was crazy about it. You know, I, I, oh, I was crazy about East Hampton. It was wonderful, you know. I mean, it was it was expensive. I mean, I had, 
I was paying for the city. I was paying. I got a, a stupidly. I got uh, a mortgage in in East Hampton, so I was paying for that, and it was a mess. I was spending ten thousand dollars a month, <coughs> so the money was going quick. But uh, oh, before I forget, um, I sent St Stephen Sondheim a copy of my book, mm -hmm. and uh, I actually have. Uh I'll show this. I've got this right here because um, you sent me a copy of this. Oh, you have that. There you have it. Very good. I forgot I sent you that. <laughs> yeah. When I read yeah. the book a couple of years ago. Um, I, I, you know, with all these stories and uh, essays that you've written about your first uh, uh, 30 years in New York, uh, what was the deciding factor for you? to sit down and write a book. I just wanted to to show my love of New York. I wanted to to I wanted to show young actors that are starting out, you know, even if you don't make it and and sadly enough most people don't make it in New York. Um, but don't give up the magic of New York. If you can't have if you can't have that uh, t t take what you can get. I mean, I, I mean, if I, 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 it just gave. I just my memories are just you know phenomenal in New York, and I just I, 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 I value every day. I value every day. Yeah, I really do. That's your agent calling you about your next. Oh month. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> They're after me already. I told and, them. And, uh, with do you think that there is a second book in your future? Possibly. Well, I'm working on the screenplay of this, actually. Um, you need to get that. No, don't worry about it. Okay. I, I need to. Uh, I'm working on the screenplay. I I uh, when I was in Florida, I worked at the airport for Delta. And a, a woman that uh, worked there during the weekend, just a volunteer, her daughter was a big writer in, in California. She wrote for Dallas and Falcon Crest and all the big shows. And uh, <coughs> she gave her a copy of my book. And she got back to me. She said, John, she said, John, I love this book. It's so wonderful. You should write a screenplay of it. She said, it would make a great movie. I think it would make a great series. That's that would be nice. Thank you. I'll take either one. Thank you. <laughs> so, so I'm halfway through the screenplay, actually. For both of us, New York has changed a lot uh, since we both came here. Sure. What are some of the changes that you really love that have happened over the course of your lifetime as a New Yorker? And what are some of the things that you really miss the most? about the New York that was here when you first came? I th think, uh, I, uh, I think that peop people don't uh, appreciate uh, the, the, uh, the beauty of New York like they used to. I think that uh, it's just not as it's just not as special to people as. Well, don't as you think, John, that, it, that because it's gotten so gentrified in certain neighborhoods? Oh, I, sure. the thing that I love about New York is um, walking around in New York. Uh, you could be walk down one street, and uh, you're in a very Asian. Uh, neighborhood. Oh, sure, sure. You turn the corner and you're in a German neighborhood, sure. another corner, and it's an Italian neighborhood. And it's this melting pot of New York. And I think that that somehow is fading away. It is fading away. It's like little Italy is, is little Chinatown now. I mean, it's not, it's not as special as it was back then. Um, now my partner, John Castagna, he was all Italian and, uh, when we met, I was living in the village, but I eventually I I moved to his apartment in the in uh, on in the Wall Street area, which was good because I worked on Wall Street. But he was Italian, and we used to go to Little Italy all the time. 
And, uh, but it's just not that way anymore. It, it's losing it, you know, and uh, I mean, the places, I mean, uh, Mott's, all, the, all those wonderful little streets, they're just not what they used to be. That's a shame. It's a shame. It really is. But. Now, you've already mentioned uh, Dan Hook's backstage, which was one of my favorite places in New York. Um, was there another haunt or uh, hangout for you? that is no longer here in New York that you really miss? Well, I, I went to Studio 54. I was, uh, I remember the first time I went there, Liza was there. And uh, I was sorry, one night, I was one night off, Jackie was there, Jackie O um, was, I just missed seeing her. I always hoped I'd run into her. And uh, it's funny. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned this. I went to see the rink. I saw the rink six times with Liza. I um, love that. I saw that. And I sat behind Jackie O at the <laughs> theater. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and I, uh, she came to her seat. She looked at me and she says, "Hello." Sat <laughs> <laughs> down. But you know, it, it was just that moment. Of, oh, oh, of I, there. And that's one of the other things. Um, that you mentioned earlier, you know, with your encounter with Hel uh, with Catherine Hepburn and wait before we jump on, this was Jackie O's. This is Jackie O's. I got this at an, at uh, at her auction. Wow. Anyway, anyway, but go ahead. But I, I was going to say the magic of being in New York City. Um, you know, I think that, and I'm going to say this, and then uh, we're going to wrap up our show today because we are at the end of the show. But I miss those days. Uh, before everybody was walking around in the city with their heads buried in their iPhones. Because oh, cool. this energy of making co eye contact with people and uh, constantly um, true. running into celebrities, seeing everyone, they're there. It's yeah. true. It's not that way. It's a shame. It's Everybody's looking at their phone. It's, it's, it's so upsetting. It's so upsetting. Well, I want to ask you another question before we start to wrap things up. And of course, uh, this is a speculation question. Um, you don't have the answers, but uh, now that the vaccines are there and we're going to be uh, rejoining the human race again, uh, to quote Miss Levi, um, how do you think that New York is going to come back? I, I, th I think it'll come back maybe by the end of the year. Yeah, I think it'll be the. Uh, uh, yeah, it'll it'll take this entire year, I'm sure. But I think the beginning of next year, things will start to come back. Um, and since you know your life is based on uh, the various shows that you've seen over the years, what's the one show that you're looking forward to seeing when everything comes back? If if one of the ones I loved came back. No, what is the one show that you're looking forward to seeing? Oh, that I didn't get to see. Uh, oh, gee, I, I really don't know of of a show, of a show that I missed. That's you know that's on the boards that that you haven't seen yet. I I don't know. I can't think of one. Uh, uh, well, it'll be in your next book. It'll be in my next book. I I I, I wanted to show you. This is my Victor Victoria. Um. This was, I, I got this on eBay. This was, uh, one of the stagehands had it. And here's, remember when Julie gave up the... Uh, yes. She said, uh, and, oh. There yeah. We go. And this was, wait, I wanted to show you this. This was the shirt that she wore in her tux in Victor Victoria. Wow. <laughs> the well, obviously you love her, you know. I do, I love her. I can't I believe this, John, but we are at the end of our show. No, oh no. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. I hope you. you enjoyed the show, and I hope you did. I hope that you'll all go and sign my guest book at richardskipper.com. If you're listening to this on your favorite platform for podcast, leave a comment there. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, please leave a comment on YouTube. That helps in terms of expanding our audience. Um, I want to let everyone know that tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock, I'm going to be celebrating Robert Neal Marshall. He's a producer, filmmaker, actor, and as he said, 
and this is true of John and myself too, he's still a kid inside. Um, for sure. I also end every show by asking everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list and the first name that pops up, reach out and call that person. Not a text message, not an email, not an inbox on Facebook, but call them. Let them know what they mean to you. As my dear friend David Friedman says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And you never know what someone else is going through. Please reach out. John, again, I want to- It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, before we get there, I do want to say uh, I hope that everyone will get this book. It is a great, great read. And if you love New York, if you love the theater, uh, you're going to love this book. So please well, thank you. get thank it. Thank you so much, Richard. And John, I want to give you the final word. Anything that you want to say about anything that we talked about that you want to expound upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any message that you want to put out to everyone at this time. And again, thank you for all that you've given. Uh, okay. we I, I failed to mention uh, when I lived in the Hamptons, I, I, uh, at auction, I won a golf game with Matt Lauer. <laughs> I, and I'd never played golf before in my life. So I took lessons at the Chelsea Piers for two months. This was the club that I played with him. Each hole, I got worse and worse and worse. It was at the Sandwich Club in Greenwich, Connecticut. It was he and two other people from NBC. I made a total fool of myself. But was it worth it? Yes, it Good. was. It's fine. It was an experience. It was an experience. And he was very nice. He was That's trying. Beautiful. Here, here is it. <laughs> well, thank you. But, 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 but my book is loaded with these crazy adventures of mine. And I, I, think, I think it's enjoyable. It is very enjoyable. I absolutely love the book. Well, and thank you, Rosa Puzo. Uh, for well, Rosa, top, yes, please thank her. She was so sweet. She was yeah. so sweet to go to, to, to arrange this. Yes. Really, she was charming, charming, charming. Oh, thank you, thank you, John. Have a good thank day. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank I, you. I want you to come here, and I'll, we'll, we'll have, we have to we have to experience the old New York. We'll it's, make it happen. Absolutely. As soon as I can get my vaccine, you know, we're going to do that. Okay, I have, I've had mine. You'll get yours. Thank you. Okay, Bye. love you. Okay, Thank you. Thank you.